Hey everyone, I'm JP, youth pastor here at Bear Creek Assembly of God. And I'm Jenny, the kids and online pastor. And we want to welcome you to Bear Creek and tell you how excited we are that you chose us to worship with today. Most of you have already noticed a few changes around our church. Not only are we updating our facilities, but we're also updating our technology. And we need your help. Everyone, please pull out your phones. If you are a first time guest with us today, we would love to connect with you. You can text NEW to 1-844-259-0900. Or you can open your camera app and scan this code on the screen now. If you're a regular attender, we need you to update your information with us as well. You can text UPDATE to 1-844-259-0900, the same number, or open your camera app and scan this update code on the screen. By updating or adding your information through this text link, you will enable us to connect with you quickly and easily. More advancements will be coming soon. Stay tuned in the coming weeks. If you have kids with you today, we have an awesome children's service going on in the youth building behind the sanctuary. Please see one of our hospitality team members in the foyer for directions. If you are 55 plus, don't miss great food and fellowship at this month's Senior Adult Luncheon, Thursday, April 29th at 11.30 a.m. The lunch will be held in the Fellowship Hall. You can contact Pastor Ben for more information. BCAG Young Adults will be having a special Bible study this coming Sunday, May 2nd from 3 to 5 p.m. at the Amavita Coffee Shop in St. Andrews. Join them for a time of coffee and a stroll around St. Andrews as they discuss the Bible. You can contact Brenna for more information. Stay connected with your church family and our online campus through Facebook. If you're on the go, listen to sermons, Bible studies, and more on our podcast channel. Stay tuned for advancements coming soon to enhance your online experience throughout the entire week. Thank you so much to all of our guests and church family for being here with us today. Good morning, Bear Creek. How's everybody feeling today? Okay, look, we're gonna we're gonna try that one more time. How is everybody doing? I listen. I know that I know it's raining. I know it's been raining for three days straight, and I know probably some of us probably had to kayak here to church. But you know what? That's okay. And you know why? Because God is still good. Amen? Amen. Come on, let's join together today as the body of Christ in worship. And I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Come on. It man's empty praise and treasures the faith. Are never enough. Then you came along That's right. and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Come on, let me hear you sing. There's nothing better than you.
into your life and he lifted all the burdens of your life your sins your past is forgiven come on let's give praise let's glorify him come on give him your best this morning amen amen oh god how we love you we praise you this day god thank you god that you make seas in the highways god that you make gardens out of our graves god that our morning can turn to joy god thank you father you're a faithful a faithful god and we praise you in the house amen Thank you, praise team. I'll have you guys come back in just a moment. You may be seated in the house. I know this is a little bit different than what we usually do, but you know what? I like to keep you on your toes because you know why? Y'all get into a rut. Y'all get into a routine. Now, I'm a routine kind of guy, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I just feel like the nature of today's service and what we're about to do, it, it almost demands a change in our schedule. Amen. I'm going to be preaching on communion this morning, and uh, if you would, if you have not received your elements and would like to partake of communion, you can raise your hand, and our greeters and our back, our hospitality team, be more than happy to bring them to you. If you're watching online, thank you so much for joining us. Matter of fact, let's greet our online family. Come on, church, let's give them praise. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, and if you would like to participate in communion and remembering what the Lord has done for us, please go ahead and get your juice and Get your cracker, whatever elements you want to use, and have it prepared for the end of the service because we would really love for you to fellowship with us in communion. Praise God. Well, if you would, turn in your Bibles this morning to uh, Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And like I said, a little bit different this morning. Don't apologize for it. I just felt like uh, we needed to, I needed to address communion. Amen? Address communion this morning. As you're turning, I just want to tell you about this lady, uh, you, you know, I like to. I don't just like like say this lady, this man. I like to give names so it makes it a little bit more personal. But there's this there's this lady by the name of Deborah, and uh, one day Deborah was selected to be on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. I mean, what an honor to be on that television program and compete for a million dollars. You know how uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire works, right? I mean, you have to answer so many questions and give your final answer. And so she was doing so well. She come down. The last question was coming, and if she got it right. She answered correctly. She was going to win a million dollars. And, and this was not an easy task. If you've ever watched the show, I, I try to participate from home, and I'm a lot smarter than I, no, I'm not as smart as I look. I probably, that makes, I'm really not smart. But she was doing so well, and it came down. But she had already had to use two of her lifelines. She would already had to pull the, the, the audience. She she'd already had to have one eliminated to 50-50. And so here she was. And just like it ought to be to win a million dollars, the last question ought to be tough. And so the question came down and the host asked, which of the following species of birds does not build its own nest, but instead lays its eggs in the nests of other birds? And so tough question. Of course, they give the answer. Is it A, the condor? Is it B, the buzzard? Is it C, the cuckoo? Or is it D, the vulture? Well, Deborah wasn't sure about this. I mean, there's a lot on stake for a million dollars. I mean, you'd think that sounds like an easy question to answer, but when there's a million dollars on the line, that is not an easy question to answer. So she's thinking, and the last thing she wanted to do was her to call a friend because before she went to be on the show, her husband, we'll just call his name Glenn, made her promise, you are going to call me. I want to be on Who Wants to Be on Me. I want to be in there somehow. And so she promised me. She said, well, I can't break my promise to my husband. Like I said, we'll call his name Glenn. So unsure of the question, she said, should I take a chance on this? I don't want to go from a million dollars to 25000 This is big. She said, well, what's it going to hurt? Plus, I need to go ahead and ask. So she called him. She said, Glenn, and gave him the question answered. And, and without even hesitating, Glenn says, it's C, the cuckoo. It's C, the cuckoo. That's what it is. It's, oh, man, Deborah's a little unusual. I don't know, you know. He's not the brightest bulb in the package. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of a rescuer. I've always taken in stray animals, and he's kind of like one of those projects. But he's, I don't know, but not sure. She says, well, at least this way, if I get it wrong, it's because of him, and he can't be angry with me. See, he can't be upset with me. So sure enough, she says, okay, I'm going to say it's see the cuckoo. Final answer. And the host says, okay, and sure enough, she goes, the answer is, that's absolutely correct, and you are a millionaire, and the balloons and the confetti all fell to the big celebration. Of course, that evening, 
Deborah, with her check, gets on her plane and heads home. I'm going somewhere with this, I promise you. <laughs> and, of course, as she, Glenn greets her at the airport, they hug and kiss and celebrate it. And she goes, Glenn, how did you happen to know that was the right answer? Come on, how did you know that? She, he goes, come on, Deborah. Everybody knows a cuckoo don't build nests. He lives in a clock. No, Miss Deborah, I was not setting you up, sweetheart. <laughs> you ought to know better than that. Cuckoos live in a clock. You know what? Sometimes we make assumptions about people or take for granted that people know things when, in fact, they really don't know. And today, we're going to look at communion and make sure we all understand what it means. We need to make sure. We don't need to be guessing. Uh, we need to make sure we understand what communion means to us. Paul in 1 Corinthians, is writing to a church in Corinth uh, that's, well, let's just put it this way. They're having some struggles in the area of, of carnality. They're living in the flesh. They're still battling the flesh. They're still dealing with false religion. They're still dealing with uh, sensuality. They're still dealing with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. I use that because that's a biblical term uh, that Paul deals with quite frequently in the gospel. And so, or in the New Testament, rather. And so Paul, he, he's, he's directing it, so he writes to correct and give guidance. That's what his purpose is. That's Because that's what a good shepherd does. A good shepherd just doesn't assume things. And when a good shepherd sees things that need to be corrected. Or where guidance is given. A good shepherd leads. He leads. And, and so today, not that I'm seeing any uh, flaws in how we approach communion. I just feel that sometimes we just don't understand what communion is. And I want to make sure that we have a full grasp of it. And why it's important for us to take it. So, so in this particular part of his letter, Paul is correcting the church on how they are participating in communion, and his goal is to elevate them. His goal is correcting, but it's, it's to elevate them, it's to bring them to understand, it's to correct, but understand why they're participating in communion, and challenge them not to take communion lightly. Because, see, I'll be honest with you, sometimes we, we usually have it on the last Sunday of the month. That's when we usually... We usually do it. And I think sometimes because it becomes a routine. And I told you, routine is fine. I don't think there's anything wrong with routine. But sometimes in routine, maybe we forget the meaning behind what we're doing. And so that's what today's about, to bring attention to this. See, because we don't need to take it lightly. We normally take communion on the last Sunday of the month. But you know why we're not taking communion next Sunday? I'll tell you why. It's so important to me. I'm not going to be with you next Sunday. I'm not going to be in person with you next Sunday. And I want to take communion with you. That's, that's how strong I feel about what we're about to do. It, it's, it's not a time to just, well, we're going to talk about what it is. But understand, it's important. It may not be that important to you. I hope today when we're done, it is that important to you. I, I hope today, when we, it, it's not something to worship, but it is part of worship. See? And, and I want to bring it to our attention today. So we dare not take it lightly. It's very special and sacred. Because who gave it to us, church? Jesus, our Lord, he's the one who instituted this, something we should want to participate in. Matter of fact, can I be honest with you? The last Sunday of the month should be the one Sunday you don't miss on Sunday morning. Because you ought to know, if you've been coming for any length of time, that that's the Sunday we take communion. We ought to want to come together and fellowship in the death and resurrection of our Lord. It's that important. You can do it at home by yourself, but there's something about when the body of Christ, when we come together in fellowship and we remember what the Lord did for us, did for me, but did for us in instituting the church, his body. We should all want to be a part of it. So as we look at it, I got four brief, yes, I did say brief, no, I'm not a liar, nor I intend to be a liar, brief points are messages that we see in this scripture we're about to read. We're going to go scripture by scripture. We're going to break it down, and I hope when we're finished with it, you will have either a renewed appreciation or a new appreciation for why we do what we do when we take communion. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. This is from Jesus. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it 
in remembrance of me. So the first message I see as Jesus instituted communion, and Paul is now reminding us of what Jesus said, the first message is found in the symbols of communion. When we look at that, we, we have two symbols in the communion. Now, I know this is not the traditional way we do it. We call this our, our Jesus Lunchables out of fun. Not to be disrespectful, though. This is a to-go pack. This is because of COVID. I hope soon we can go back to doing communion the, the, the way we've done it before, where we actually serve. That's part of my points I'm going to make in a minute. But those two symbols, that wafer represents the bread. It symbolizes the body of the Lord Jesus Christ that took upon it the sin of the world. We have to understand that. The bread is a reminder us of his body and all that he went through for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin. God, or Jesus himself made him, but God imputed the sin upon Jesus. He had no sin upon him. He was sinless so that in him we might become what? The righteousness of God or so that we might be right standing with God. When they beat Jesus, when they whipped him, when they plucked his beard, when they spit upon him, when, when, when they took him and mocked him, when they put that thorn of crowns upon his head, when they throw the nail, drove the nails through his hands and his feet and hung him on, on that cross, what his body went through for you and I, we should never, ever take for granted. That's something you deserved. He did no sin, but you have. But he, he was the, the substitute for you. He took it up on himself. He was nailed to the cross. He'd done so so what? We could have a relationship with God. The cup, but more importantly, what's in the cup, this, the juice, the, the, the fruit of the vine, the juice, it, it symbolizes his blood. It said this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. So the vine, the fruit of the vine, it represents the blood of Jesus that was shed up on the cross, upon Calvary. It is his blood that washes away your sin. It is the blood that cleanses us and makes us whole. It's through the blood that God sees us as righteous. His blood, it is his blood that sanctifies us. Why? Because there is power in the blood of Jesus. There's no other blood power like the power that we find in the blood of Jesus. Where the sacrifice of animals could not wash away their sin. It was a momentary thing. It would only last for as long until they sinned again. But this blood, the blood of Jesus, he doesn't have to die on the cross again for you and I. He did it once and for all, for all eternity. He's become the ultimate sacrifice for you and me. Oh, that's powerful. That is powerful. That's what we are remembering. That's just one of the things that we are remembering. And we eat this, 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 this bread and we drink this juice. It's remembering the blood and the body and what Jesus went through for our salvation. But there's also the message of the guarantees that we see in communion. There are guarantees. Look at verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup... You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So when we take communion, there's some things that we can be certain about, okay? There's some guarantees. There's things that you can be absolutely, or you should be absolutely convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt. You can count on this. Better than Toyota. Sorry, Miss Debbie. You can count on this. The first is the Lord's death. Well, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Very simple. When you take communion, it should remind you that Jesus is, he died. He definitely died. He wasn't just in a lifeless coma. He didn't just slip into unconsciousness. Life left his body. That is so important for you and I. If, his, if life never left his body, then there is no promise or guarantee of life in the resurrection. He is the first fruit of the resurrection, if you read the word correctly. He had to resurrect so that we could resurrect. It was the power over death that he demonstrated when God brought Jesus back to life. You can be guaranteed that Jesus died on that cross. He died as dead as dead can be. Why is that important? I told you because why. There's another guarantee in that. Not only did he die, but he came back to life. And one day, he's coming back again. Not only did he die, did they lay him in the grave for three days, but life came back to his body. It was a physical body that had life in it just like you and I. Oh, you should be amen. I'm going to amen, pastor. Y'all should keep saying, preach on, pastor. If you're not, I'm going to anyways. 
Do we take that so lightly, the, the promise of the life after death? Oh, and the promise that he's coming back again? This world is temporary. We're just temporarily, we're just, we're just passing through this land. This is not my home. One day that trumpet is going to sound and we're going to rise and we're going to go to heaven with him. Amen. I'm telling you, church, you need to get excited about what the guarantee is. guaranteed. He died. No, don't even doubt it for a moment. Oh, and he rose again and he's coming back for a bride, spotless, that's without wrinkle, that's looking and loving for his appearing. Are you looking to the Easter church? I know this is a little unusual for me to preach like this, but I get excited when I start talking about communion because of what it means to me, church. Whew. One day I'm going to get a glorified body too. I'm going to look like that man my wife fell in love with 30-something years ago. And so are you, Brother Glenn. Hang on, Deborah. <laughs> I can speak about a few of y'all, but I'll leave it alone. I'll leave it alone this morning. Jesus died for our sin to be forgiven, and he will come again just like he said he would, and you can count on it. It's guaranteed. The third message I see as I studied this scripture this week, there, there is a principle here that is so important to us before we take communion, and it's called self-examination. Verse 27 reads, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, don't, don't go past that scripture. If we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But if we judge ourselves, should be, but when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. See, what was happening was some of the people were coming together for the sole purpose to eat. They were hungry. They just wanted fellowship. So they were, some of them were gluttons. Some of them were just poor people. But the emphasis of this meal became became about the eating and not remembering the Lord's death. So Paul says, there's some of you even getting drunk. That's why we don't use real wine. I'm worried about y'all. No, it's just what it symbolizes is what's important. He said, but some of them were even getting drunk. So Paul says, you better check your motives. You, you better make sure you're, you're taking what we're about to do seriously. It's not something just go through the motions on. And this is a challenge for us today. Why? Because we need to examine ourselves before we partake. Before you eat this wafer and drink this juice, before you celebrate the Lord's death, you need to do some self-evaluation. You need to do some self-analysis. You need to make sure that you are taking it in a proper way and not being in an irreverent manner. You need to make sure that you're doing, doing what the Lord has instructed us to do before we take because you don't want to take this moment lightly, carelessly. If you do, then you're guilty of the body. See, what does that mean? That basically means you're no different than those who spit on him, those who jeered him, and those who demanded Jesus' death. If you're taking it lightly, you know they took his body lightly. They took his life lightly. And that's really what this means. You're taking the life of Jesus' as death. and You're taking it lightly. You're not, you're not grasping what the value of it is. The only one who could lay down their life for us did. We dare not take that life. So Paul says you need to examine yourself. Judge yourself. And we get the idea that examining yourself or judging yourself means that you have to be free from sin. Good luck. Good luck. That's not what this means. It's not that you're without sin. That's why Jesus had to die in the first place. It doesn't mean free from sin, but it does mean to be repentive of your sins. See, don't disgrace the grace that God has given you the mercy he's extended to you, the love that he's given you. It just means, look, you need to be repentive of this. Thing. You need to be sorry for what you've done. And I believe it means you don't take communion if you knowingly are living in sin. Now, we're all sin. I know. What does that mean? You are habitually doing things or living in a, in a way that is contrary to the word of God. That means you're not living your testimony that you claim to be. If you claim to be a Christian, then you ought to be Christ-like. And if you're not and you're habitually living in sin and neglecting the body, neglecting 
the, the, the fellowship, neglecting the word of God, and you're just living life the way you want to, I, 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 that's what he's talking about. Don't do that. You're taking what Jesus did for you lightly. See? Don't do that. It means to make sure you're in the right relationship with God and the body of Christ. And my, Paul makes it clear in this verse that precedes him that the reason that he is correcting here is because the church lacked unity. He says there's factions amongst you. There's divisions among you. You're coming together for communion, and, and this group goes on and eat without this group, and this group's gathering over here. And there's nothing wrong with friends. There's nothing wrong with groups. You have some. There's a group of guys went out yesterday. About eight or nine of us had a great time. That's not a faction. That's just a small group of guys who wanted to get away from their wives. I mean, wanted to go out and fellowship. I'm sorry. So he's not talking about that. He's talking about there being legitimate divisions among you. See? He says, it ought not be that way. He, that's why he's bringing this to Christ. You've lost the purpose, the meaning in it, and, and, and why you're doing that. They weren't waiting on one another and taking it and, and, and talking to, or, or getting together, waiting on each other. So not only are we to examine ourselves to ensure our relationship with Jesus is in good standing, but also make sure that we're in good standing with the body of Christ. So you should be examining your relationships with one another. If someone has offended you, you need to forgive them. If, if you've offended somebody, then you ought to go to them and make it right. That's really what Paul is saying right here. There ought not be any disunity in the body of Christ. See, not alienating yourself. Not being standoffish. Not holding hard feelings towards one another. Because see, relationships are important in the kingdom of God. The reason why he came is so we could have a relationship with him. And then he says, now you have a relationship with each other. Because why? You have to understand, this is not figurative speech. You are the body of Christ. That's not figurative. You are the body of Christ. He embodies you. You walk in obedience to his word. You walk in the leading of his Holy Spirit. That is your obligation as a follower of Christ. And so therefore, you are, and we are to come together, and we are to work in, together, and we are to live in unity. It doesn't mean we always agree on everything. We ought to agree on everything that the word of God says, the doctrine, but we may not all agree on the color of the carpet or the light, the brightness of the lights or, or, or what we have for our seniors' dinner. Maybe we ought to have uh, pork chops and Instead of fried chicken this time. All right, we can disagree. We can agree to disagree. But when it comes down to it, we have to, we have to live in unity. At the end of the day, we have to be united because a house divided will not stand, not just talking about a church building, but talking about a church that is the embodiment of Jesus Christ. How dare us come and take communion when there's anything we have against somebody or we've offended somebody? You're bringing judgment upon yourself. Do you hear what Paul is saying? He said, it's better for you to go ahead and judge yourself so God doesn't have to judge you. That's examination. Oh, I know the last two weeks have been tough. I know something about Easter just got me fired up. I'm telling you something, church. Hear me. I'm speaking. I don't know if I'm operating the gift of prophecy, foreknowledge, or or, 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 I'm not sure. God is preparing us for a harvest in this community. That's not hopeful speech. I know within my heart, we have to be prepared for when people walk through those doors. We're not gonna be perfect. We wanna be a hospital for those who are spiritually, emotionally, physically sick, but we have to be prepared. That don't mean we're perfect, but why would God send people to this fellowship if we're not prepared for them? And to be prepared, we've gotta be right. We've gotta be together. We got to be walking and living what the word says, not to be legalistic, not to be judgmental. So when those people come in, they find a safe environment, a healthy environment that they can be healed and grow and reach for the kingdom of God. Come on, you give God praise. I'm not angry with you. I'm more like your coach saying, "Come on, come on, come on, re, 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 kick him in the knee. Come on, we can do this." Dare not take communion in an unworthy manner. Because if you do, you bring judgment upon yourself. What Paul says here is not to be exaggerated. He says, matter of fact, that's the reason why some of you are sick and and ill and weak. And you're dying or you've died. We We don't need to exaggerate that. That's not a doctrine that we stand upon. In other words, he's not saying every time you do that, 
that you're going to get sick and you're going to die, you're going to become weak. But what he is saying is this, and I believe this firmly. If we do it in an unworthy manner, we open the door up for God to come and judge us now. That's a part of theology we don't think about. But I don't care if it's the Old Testament or New Testament. God is still a God of judge. He says, you have, it has to be right. Now Jesus, his blood covers us. But we all stand before God the Father one day. And I would much rather him deal with me now than have to deal with me then. You can't tell me God doesn't judge our sin now because there are, there are repercussions to our sin now. He doesn't spare you from your idiocy, from your mistakes, from your sin. See, I said I was going to be brief, so I'm going to back, back behind here. No, can't go there. Mm-mm. You step out in sin, there's a consequence to it. Not only is there a separation or, or at least there's, there's a, there, there is a, a, a distancing of your relationship. I know we can talk the semantics of theology of once saved, always saved. I know we can, we can debate that until the cows come home. Okay? But understand your pastor this morning. When you willingly step out and do sin, when you willingly do the things you know you ought not to, you know that puts a distance between you and God. It's not that God has moved. It's you're willingly moving outside his will for your life. That you cannot argue with. So examine yourself. Make sure you're not, you're taking seriously what you're about to do. Make sure you have a humble and repentant heart. Make sure you're, you're in unity with the body of Christ. Loving one another. Serving one another. Forgiving one another. And then the fourth thing is this. Verse 33. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. Wait. So then, therefore, this matter of taking the Lord's Supper is so important. So then, wait for one. It's so important. You dare not move forward without everybody. It's so important. Don't start without everybody. Wait upon them. Communion for the early church usually included a meal, a time of fellowship. Paul is addressing this here. Matter of fact, remember, Jesus took the Passover meal, which was a time of reflection, a time of remembering what God did for the Israelites coming out of Egypt and the bondage of slaves, of slavery. And he took it and he made it into communion, time to remember what he has done for us. But what they would do, and I like this, I love this, we, I, we've got to try this sometime, maybe in the near future, where instead of just taking communion, we actually have a meal of fellowship. And then we take communion. But what was happening, these people, they were coming together and, and they were, because they were factions and fighting, they had people who weren't getting anything to eat, and they were starting without other people, and they were neglecting people. And, and, and it became something that it wasn't supposed to be. And so Jesus, Paul, Jesus through Paul is saying, listen, you need to wait. Make sure everyone is there. Don't start without everyone being there. And, and, and then he says, share or serve. I'm going to share what I have with you. I'm going to, sharing is a form of serving. I'm giving to you. I, I am serving you. So another message in communion is that we are to share or serve one another. Be of service to one another. Help me, let me, allow me to meet your need for hunger. Let me allow, allow me to meet your need for fellowship. What can I do uh, to be a part of your life? What can I do to help you? And wasn't that the purpose for Jesus coming to begin with? Didn't he say that the Son of Man did not come to be served? He didn't show him and say, here I am, Son of God, I'm the Lamb. Takes away the sin of the world, come serve me. No, he's the one who served. He healed. He fed. He washed his disciples' feet. He served the the, the Seder meal, the Passover meal to his disciples. It was all about serving. That's why he came. He served us by dying on the cross. And he's called us to serve one another. See? It's not all about what I want. I need to be concerned what others need. It's not all about the way I want things or the way I see things. It's about what others might be in need of. Do I wait around for somebody else or, or am, I eager to, am I eager to help or, or am I going to be the first one in line? Am I going to be the first one to do this? It's, it's all about the intention of the heart. What is your heart? Do I look for opportunity to serve others? Because you, as a child of God, are called to serve. Jesus demonstrated this when he took out his outer cloak and, 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 and wrapped a rag around his waist and he washed the disciples' feet. He took the lowliest place of a servant. That, was, that, that position of washing the people's feet was left to the servant who had just gotten in trouble, and that's part of his punishment, 
or was the newest servant or the lowest in the pecking order? Because who wanted to wash someone's feet? Because of the fact that, let's don't get gross, but they walked around with sandals, open-toed shoes, and let's say they didn't have indoor plumbing back then. And animals were outside of walking were the primary form of transportation. It was nasty. It was dirty. And who in the world would want dirty feet in your face while you're eating? I, I know I wouldn't. So Jesus says, no one else offered to do this. Let me demonstrate what you're supposed to do for one another. It's, it's, it's a humbling. It's a respectful thing. It's about serving. That is our kingdom duty, to look for opportunities where I can be a service to other people. Wait upon them. Serve them. Unity. As a, as a praise team comes on back up, and we prepare to take communion, we're going to have a few moments to where we're going to worship. And I want to give you some direction during this time. Worship isn't about you. I know you know that, but I just need to remind you. It's not about you. It's about him. What do you mean, Pastor? We often look for songs that we like that move us. And I'm saying we don't have to hit a single note. And you should still be ready to worship the Lord. It's this attitude of the heart. That's what my point is. And during this time is a time of self-examination of yourself. This is a time that we're purposely going to slow it down before we take communion. And I want you to just reevaluate your life. I want you to think about what I've preached today, what the Lord has laid on my heart for us today. This is for you. This is for the entire church. This is for the entire body of Christ. This is for anyone who's watching online. But it's definitely for those online that's here today as well who are listening to this message. This is for you. You're not here by chance just because you decide, well, I'm going to go to church today. I'm thankful you're here. But God ordained this message for this church. I wish the church was, I wish every seat was filled. I wish everybody who called this church home was here today. Because we're about to do one of the most special, and I even hate to use the word sacred, because when we say sacred sometimes, it even takes the meaning. It's, it's one of the most precious forms of worship that we could do. And as you evaluate, you make yourself right. We're going to take communion together at the end. We'll do it as a, together. We'll bless it and do it together. But I want you to just evaluate your life and just allow the Holy Spirit to come in as you worship the Lord. Worship Him. I hope as you evaluate, it actually causes... I know when I evaluate my life, and I see how sinful I am, I don't, I don't deserve what Jesus did on the cross. It causes me to worship Him. He did for me what I couldn't do for myself. He did for you what no one else could do. As much as I love you, and if I chose to lay my life down for you being careful with my words it wouldn't do what Jesus did for you I might be able to save your life in a moment if an oncoming car was coming or a bullet and I pushed you out of the way but I can't save you for eternity as much as I want to you know I, I, my heart, I don't want to see anyone die and perish and turn to separate from God even the people who make me mad even the people who who who, who caused such pain as in my past. I, I, I don't hate them to the point that I would want them to spend eternity separate from God. I, I, trust me. If you are, then you're guilty of murder. It's a hard situation. So as we, we worship the Lord, they lead us in worship. We're in the presence of God. We've made that point many times already. So allow the presence of God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to come upon you or come out of you, however you want to phrase it. Evaluate you. Don't evaluate yourself by your standard. Allow the Holy Spirit to evaluate you by God's standard. And just make sure your motive is pure today. Make sure your motive is pure today. If you're not saved, I'm looking at mostly home folks today. I think everybody here calls it home. But if you're not saved, this is the moment you want to be saved. You definitely don't want to take communion if you're not. Because then you're bringing judgment upon yourself. Evaluate. How are you serving others? Are there people in the church that you would not have any kind of fellowship with because of whatever, X, Y, Z? 
Is there someone in the church maybe who's hurt you and you've yet to forgive them? Is there someone in church you have offended and you've not made it right with them? This could get messy real fast, but this is the time to do it. Otherwise, don't take communion. That's what Paul says. There's some of you that are sick, that are weak, and have died because you've taken lightly what Jesus has given us. See, it's not the elements you're taking lightly. It's what he did on Calvary that you're taking lightly. Amen? Let's worship the Lord.
you're here this morning as we prepare to remember the Lord's death. If you're sick in body today, I want you to do, if you want, if you believe in the power of prayer, if you believe in healing, if you believe the scripture, and today you, this goes for you watching online as well. You may not be able to physically do this, but you can do it in your living room right there. Bedside assembly, come on. If you're sick in your body today, and you need a healing, you need a touch, you want to stand in for somebody, I want you to bring your elements and out of an act of faith, I want you to walk into these altars and stand here. You're going to take communion in the place of worship. You're going to take communion in the place of sacrifice. If that's you today, come on. Don't be shy. If you need touch in your body today, bring your elements with you. We're going to take them together. We're going to take them together. Get your elements. J.W., get your elements. Get your elements. Come on, bring your, bring your communion elements with you. Bring the body and the blood with you. Come on. Come on. Get them prepared. And we're going to take it together, church, all right? We're going to take this together. But these folks need a touch, or they know somebody in their life that needs a touch. Come on, make room. Come on, there's plenty of room right up here. I'll get out of the way. Come on. We're not going through the motions. We're not going to go through the motions. You believe in miracles today. Do you believe in miracles today? Do you believe God heals today? We know that Isaiah, foreseeing into the future through the Spirit, prophesied is by the broken body of Jesus. One of the benefits of the broken body of Jesus is healing. It says, by His stripes, you are. Now that's the English translation of the Hebrew, which means it's a definite, for sure, it's done. Matter of fact, I can say right now that your body is not agreeing with the Word of God. That's not casting stones here this morning. Hear what I'm saying. Understand behind the Word of God. If it says you're already healed and you're feeling sick today, that means your body's not lining up with what the Word says about you. I'm not saying that's your fault. I'm just saying we're going to pray and we're going to believe. It's called faith. Seeing what it is, but believing it's, it's not what it is, right? The Bible says, Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe when it comes to his resurrection. That's true about everything in faith. That is faith. Believing it even though you don't see. And I'm not trying to get you hyped up. I'm not trying to. I am trying to build your faith right now. Craig, I'm tired of seeing you walk with a cane. And I don't want you to have surgery. God created you from the dust. Come on. He told to the prophet, he said, speak to the dry bones. And he spoke and he spoke. And uh, sinew came on and ligaments came on and flood. And then they were standing dead. He said, now speak. And he spoke the spirit, the power, the pneuma into them. And they came alive. Now look, if the word ain't real, I'm going to go find something else to do. But I'm tired of playing games. It's either real or it's not. I'm just crazy enough to believe it. Actually, I don't think you have to be crazy. You just got to have faith. Come on. JR is healed. The Bible says it. JR is healed. My wife's healed. You're healed. Jerry's healed. Your grandmother's healed. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. I don't know what everybody's going through, but you have to quit saying, I need healing and start saying, I am healed. If your body don't feel like it, then don't agree with the flesh. Come on. Now I'm preaching. I'm preaching to somebody. Quit believing the flesh. Flesh lies to you, Sister Griffin. Flesh lies. Your feelings, as much as they may be real, are not true. Help me, Jesus. Y'all just thought I was going to end early today. God wanted to do something else here today. I'm waiting on somebody. Someone else needs to move. Someone else needs to move. It needs healing. That needs healing in their body right now. It needs healing in their body. Come on. What are you waiting on? What are you waiting on? If you believe it, why do I have to move, Pastor? Because that's an that's believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. You can believe all you want to, but you got to do something that says, This is why I believe. I'm showing you that I believe. Mm. I feel like having church. Father, you know why each person is up here today. 
Lord, I think more than calling us to a time of healing, Father, physically, emotionally. God, I, I really think, God, you're calling us to a place of obedience. Fathers, I pray for the sheep that you've put under my leadership, God, my heart, Lord, you know it. And God, you, you are calling us to a deeper place in you, a place that our faith does not waver. God, when the messages of the world enter into our hearts and our mind, God, we, we stand upon your word and not what's coming through the airways, God, not what's coming through the news, God, not what's coming, Father, from the outside of your, your plan for us, God, outside messages, Lord. God, I thank you. I thank you today. You're, you're like that coach, Father, that is on the sideline, God, is just cheering us on right now, saying, yes, yes, you're finally, you're finally getting it, Lord. God, thank you, God. Thank you so much, Lord. May we today, Father, walk in obedience to your word, God, agreeing with your word, Lord, living out your word, God. And if your word says we're healed, then, Lord, let us start living our lives with healed bodies, healed minds, healed emotions, healed spirits. God, just help us, Lord, walk in obedience to you today, God. In Jesus' name. God, your word also reminds us in Isaiah that is by the stripes, by all that he went through, God. Lord, that the iniquity that so suppresses your people, the habitual sin, has now been healed as well. God, we do not have to come under subjection of the habits of our lives that the world and the enemy has placed upon us, God. Many of them we placed upon ourselves, God, just being stupid. Lord, you're wanting to break those chains. You're wanting to break everything that holds us back, Lord, from walking in obedience and the fullness of your blessing and your calling. And your calling. Oh, God, that is the big picture today. It's about your calling. So, God, right now, as we break this wafer, God, it's just bread, but, Lord, it represents something so powerful in our lives. The body of Jesus. Lord, as we begin, to, Lord, to, to take this cup, this fruit of the vine, this, this, this grape juice, Lord, it's just juice, but God, what it represents is so precious to us, God. It's precious. God, what Jesus did for us 2,000 years ago, oh, only He could do. Oh, how we value it. I value it, God. Lord, I dare not disrespect it. God, I dare not stand in judgment of it. Lord, so we've evaluated our lives, God. We find it precious, God, and valuable. So therefore, Lord, I know anything I value, God, that I find value in, Lord, I, I get it. I take it, Lord. I cherish it. God, I cherish it, Lord. My family pictures, God. Lord, the, 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 the memories of, of, of my childhood, Lord, the, the, the memories of my kids' childhood, Lord, the early days of, of my life with my wife, God. The, I cherish those things because they're value, Lord. I do, I do the same, God, with the blood and the body of your son, Jesus. I, I value them. I cherish them. I protect them, God. Oh, God, I hold them precious. Jesus. Now, Lord, may our bodies, our minds, and our spirits, Lord, align with your word. We're healed. No more depression. That's for somebody today. That's for somebody today. Someone in here today is just riddled with depression. And I'm not anti-medication, but you have to take so much medication just to sleep because of the anxiety and the depression in your life. And I'm here today to tell you, hear me, hear me. I'm stepping out in faith right now. You are healed. You just gotta, you just gotta believe it and act upon it. Uh, let, uh, let the Lord be the lifter of your countenance, His word says. Won't you laugh just a little bit? The Bible says that laughter is good, like a medicine. It's time for you to cast your cares upon Him, lighten the load of the burdens of life. Oh, those things you can control, you take control. But those that you can't, you leave them in His hands. And I'd even say those things you can control, let Him control those for you. Right now, Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, God. Bodies are being healed. Minds are being healed. Thank you, Father. I believe it, God. I'm seeing miracles right now. I'm seeing miracles right now. Come on. Are you believing? Are you seeing miracles? Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Let's walk the walk, talk the talk. Come on. Are you seeing miracles today? Let us partake. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, as they take the bread, Lord, let their bodies, minds, and spirits be made whole. Thank you for the juice, God, the blood that it represents. It makes us white as snow. Lord, I've never been able to figure that out, even in a common sense way, Lord. How something red, if I put it on a white garment, Lord, this, this juice, blood itself would stain it. 
But what you're saying, Father, is that our garments are dirty. Oh, God, just unrighteous, but yet the blood comes. It's got the supernatural ability to cleanse us. There's power in the blood of Jesus. And I thank you for my salvation. Thank you for the price that Jesus, the beating, the whipping, the blood that he shed on Calvary, the nails in his hands and his feet, the disgrace, God. You had to turn your back and all sin of all humanity was placed upon him. He who knew no sin became sin for me. Make it personal, church. Come on. For you. Thank you. Thank you, God, for having a plan. Thank you, Jesus, for losing the battle of your will in the garden willfully, giving in to your Father's plan. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Let us partake. Praise you, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. No other name on earth or in heaven. Jesus. The power in that name. The power in the blood. The body of Christ. Power. Liberty. Freedom. Healing. Deliverance. Peace, peace, peace right now, God. Lord, I speak peace in this congregation. Peace, peace in the name of Jesus. Peace in the name of Jesus. Lord, remove any doubts. Name of Jesus. No room for doubters, God. Only belief, only faith, God. Jesus. Now, may the Lord bless you. And look, I'm gonna, I'm, I am reading these words or speaking these words. But if you really want the blessing, you have to believe and receive the blessing. Okay? This is not routine. God told Moses to tell Aaron, speak this over my people. So I do. So may the Lord bless you. And may the Lord bless keep you. May he make his face to shine. Shine. Shine upon you and be gracious towards you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you the peace that passes all understanding. Not the peace that man can give you. Not the peace that money can give you. Really not even the peace that friends can give you unless they're speaking biblical truth to you. But only the peace that comes from knowing God in a personal way. And therefore I proclaim the name of the Lord over you all. So in the name of Jesus the Son, receive His blessings. Amen.